Ever experienced that you've awoken from a dream, only to find out you are actually still sleeping? Dreams within dreams happen sometimes. René Descartes, one French philosopher, argued that if we cannot even tell for sure whether we are dreaming, then how can we know for certain any truth about the world in which we seem to live? His famous statement, I think, therefore I am, comes from the realization that to think, one has to exist and that is the only truth beyond any doubt. Chinese philosopher Chuang Cho dreamt about being a butterfly, fluttering hither and thither, to all intents. According to Chuang, he was conscious only of his happiness as a butterfly, unaware that he was still a human being. When he finally woke up, he said, now I do not know whether I was then a man dreaming I was a butterfly, or whether I am now a butterfly, dreaming I am a man. Between a man and a butterfly, there is necessarily a distinction. Another great philosopher, Plato, explored these questions in his famous Allegory of the Cave. The Allegory of the Cave begins with a scene painted of a group of prisoners, who have lived chained to the wall of a dark cave their entire lives. Behind them is a walkway and a fire being set to display shadows on the wall in front of the prisoners. Every day, these people in the caves watch shadows projected on a blank wall. For them, these shadows are real and they shape their entire reality. Now, imagine that one of the prisoners leaves the cave and walks outside into the sunshine. For the first time in his life, he is exposed to sunshine and light. He can now finally see the true forms, shapes, and reality of the shadows he thought were real. In this allegory, what would he think of his companions back in the cave? He'd probably feel sorry for them and their limited reality. Now, if he returned back to the cave and told them about what he saw, they'd probably laugh at him and think he was crazy. Plato's allegory of the cave explores the tension between the imagined reality that we think is real, which we might refer to as shadows in this situation, versus the reality that is the truth, a reality outside the cave instead of shadows. Plato's allegory of the cave illustrates at least two things. First, it represents Plato's account of the nature of reality and his understanding of essence. Second, it's a lesson in what philosophy does, it reveals the true nature of things. Without doing philosophy, we remain in the dark. To sum up, Plato's cave is an allegory of the human condition, each of us is a prisoner, chained down with a distorted illusion of reality. To gain individual autonomy one must awaken our consciousness, we must kill our imperfections, and liberate one's senses. If the school district system were to say tomorrow that 2 plus 2, equals 5, and no longer 4, many will follow the new rule because they are mathematicians and they know more than we don't. Hence, what they say is true. All these people play a role in creating this false reality or shadow reality that we all perceive as true reality. We don't have individual autonomy despite the system stating that we possess such fundamental freedom. So what do we have to do? Your reality is a perception or as the Hindus like to call it, the Maya. Your five senses only allow you to perceive a mere figment of reality. The three-dimensional nature of our world limits our worldview with its duality paradigm, prevailing in all aspects of our experiences on Earth. Think about it, there are no absolute truths in this world, there are only different lenses of perception. The stars you see in the sky are in reality glimpses of your past. The colors you perceive as red, yellow, blue, and so on, are only reflections of different wavelengths of light. The average human body contains around seven octillion atoms, and they all seemingly know exactly what to do in order to successfully perform their function. Hidden webs of information must, therefore, be guiding the atoms and molecules in their biochemical reactions, while at the same time obeying the laws of quantum physics. All this occurs within the subsystems of the cellular machinery. Consciousness might be universal, in the sense that every system might have some degree of consciousness. This view is sometimes called panpsychism. Every system is conscious, not just humans, dogs, or other animals, but even microbes. Even a photon can have some degree of consciousness. The idea is not that photons are intelligent or thinking. But maybe photons might have some element of raw, subjective feeling, some primitive precursor to consciousness. This may sound a bit kooky to you. I mean, why would anyone think such a crazy thing? The motivation comes from the idea that perhaps, the most simple and powerful way to find fundamental laws connecting consciousness to physical processing, is to link consciousness to information. 
wherever there's information processing, there's consciousness. Where there is complex information processing, like in a human, there's complex consciousness. And where there is simple information processing, there's simple consciousness. Long before quantum physics had been developed, in the early 19th century, Arthur Schopenhauer developed his philosophy of will, which he published in a ponderous tome called, The World as Will and Representation. Schopenhauer's main thesis is that the world can be divided into two pieces, will and representation. Simple enough. But for him, these had very specific meanings. Representation is how the world appears to us. That could be either the color of a flower or the spin of an electron. Will is the underlying essence of things. Schopenhauer's ideas suggest that the underlying reality of the universe is not one of essential determinism but of will. And that would determine how reality is represented to us, even objective measurements like the position or momentum of a quantum particle. One interpretation of quantum physics is that this is exactly true. In quantum physics, we have the mysterious phenomenon of entanglement. In entanglement, two particles are correlated with one another, such that when you measure one it affects the other. At the most fundamental level of our existence, reality is far from being objective. Rather it is analogous to a series of interwoven subjective experiences fed into your awareness. Experiments like the double slit experiment and Schrodinger's cat thought experiment, challenges the traditional notions of what makes up reality. The laws of quantum physics are different from the laws of the physical universe. To understand how consciousness creates reality, you have to know how particles behave at the most fundamental level of our being. In ancient India, there was a philosopher named Shankara who told the story about an elephant and a group of blind men. A group of blind men heard that a strange animal, called an elephant, had been brought to the town, but none of them were aware of its shape and form. Out of curiosity, they said, we must inspect and know it by touch, of which we are capable. So, they sought it out, and when they found it they groped about it. The first person, whose hand landed on the trunk, said, this being is like a thick snake. For another one whose hand reached its ear, it seemed like a kind of fan. As for another person, whose hand was upon its leg, said, the elephant is a pillar like a tree trunk. The blind man who placed his hand upon its side, said that the elephant is a wall. Another who felt its tail, described it as a rope. The last felt its tusk, stating the elephant is that which is hard, smooth and like a spear. The parable has been used to illustrate a range of truths and fallacies, broadly, the parable implies that one subjective experience can be true, but that such experience is inherently limited by its failure to account for other truths or a totality of truth. Shankara used this story to illustrate the idea that reality is not always what it seems. We may all be looking at the same thing, but our perceptions and experiences are unique to us. This means that our understanding of reality can be limited by our own perspectives and biases. According to Shankara, the only way to truly understand reality is to look beyond our own limited experiences and try to see the bigger picture. By doing so, we can gain a greater understanding of the world around us and find the truth that lies beyond our own subjective experiences. Have you ever seen The Matrix? Chances are that you have. It's a rather popular film. One of the most memorable moments in the film is when Neo is presented with the choice between the red pill and the blue pill. If he chooses the red pill, he will learn the truth about reality, no matter how difficult or painful it may be. If he chooses the blue pill, he will remain blissfully ignorant of the true nature of his existence. Neo chooses the red pill and learns that he has been living in a simulation all along. However, the concept of true reality is called into question when we consider that the red pill doesn't simply grant knowledge of reality, but rather blurs the lines between what is real and what is not. This begs the question, is Neo's present experience after taking the red pill actually real? Or could he still be inside a simulation within another layer of reality? As we delve deeper into this idea, it becomes apparent that knowing what reality truly is, may be an impossibility. The Matrix only serves to prove that we may never be able to distinguish what is real and what is not. It's conceivable that we could be caught in an infinite cycle of simulations within simulations, each layer more complex than the last, without ever reaching any true reality. Just a simulation within a simulation within a simulation within a simulation. 
The idea that our universe may be nothing more than a computer-generated simulation has been a topic of philosophical debate for centuries. With the increasing power and sophistication of computing technology, it's not hard to imagine a scenario in which we have enough computational resources to simulate every single particle in the universe over the course of its history. If computing power increased to great enough levels, we could, in principle, simulate every particle in the entire universe over the course of its history. If the computer we created was a quantum computer, capable of keeping every single particle in an indeterminate quantum state, it might be able to incorporate this fundamental quantum uncertainty everything seems to possess. Maybe the simulation we live in just began seconds ago and we only think it's been 13.9 billion years, because that information was artificially included upon its creation. Maybe the universe is much smaller than we think, and all the distant galaxies, stars, and planets that we see are nothing more than simplistic representations, created by the simulation to give the illusion of a vast and expansive universe. In this scenario, the simulation would only add detail and complexity when it's needed, rather than having it be a constant and absolute property of our reality. Or maybe nothing physically exists until we are there to observe its existence. And the craziest part of it all is, maybe discovering that this is all a simulation is part of the simulation. Nick Bostrom, a Swedish philosopher, proposed in 2003 in his paper, Are You Living in a Simulation? That in the future, a technologically advanced civilization may be capable of creating simulations of their ancestors. These simulated individuals would possess an artificial consciousness that distinguishes them from the AI robots typically depicted in films, as their consciousness originates from a real person who lived on Earth in the past. Today, nearly two decades later, this concept seems increasingly plausible, especially given the current pace of progress in the field of AI. This arises a very interesting question. Let's say that the key element of a simulation is that the characters do not realize that they are in one. How do we know that the consciousness that we possess, or that voice inside our head which speaks to us belongs to us in the first place, and not some ancient race brought around in this world again by its advanced descendants? Considering humans are almost about to habilitate another planet, just 300,000 years after our first appearance on this planet and starting from literally nothing, it is fairly credible to say that given a few more years, the advanced descendants of our race would be capable of traveling through galaxies with ease, and even create their own simulated beings, which leads us back to the very beginning and hence validating the above theory. The sole purpose of chasing this possibility and understanding the purpose of our existence, is to try and understand what kind of a game we are part of to improve our chance of thriving and surviving. While the nature of consciousness, the concepts put forth by string theory, and the possibility of our existence as simulated beings all provide interesting insights into this question, there is no definitive answer yet. As humans, we experience the world through our senses and interpret this information through our consciousness. However, it is still unclear whether our perception of reality is a true representation of what actually exists, or simply a construct of our minds. The implications of this question are far-reaching, as they challenge our fundamental understanding of ourselves and the universe around us. It prompts us to ask questions about the nature of existence, our purpose in life, and our place in the grand scheme of things. In the end, it is up to each individual to grapple with this question and come to their own conclusions. Whether we are living in a simulated reality, a multiverse, or the only reality that exists, one thing is certain. The pursuit of knowledge and understanding of the universe around us will continue to push the boundaries of what we consider to be reality.